So hello to everyone. Ang topic natin for today is the truth about Giordano Bruno. So this is our second topic for our series entitled Has Science Buried God? Ang current series natin aims to give clarity sa issues related sa discourse on science and religion. Last meeting, ay we were able to show that Christianity and science are not in conflict dahil pinakita natin na consistent ang science with Christian theology. We also exposed that ang tunay na conflict ay truly between naturalism or atheism versus Christianity. Last week, we also debunked ang isang example about sa myths ng conflict sa science and religion by showing the facts about the Galileo case. Today, we will give more detail on another example sa myths ng conflict between science and religion. Ito naman is about the case of Giordano Bruno. But before we discuss it, let me repeat again ang brief na introduction ko about 4-H apologetics. Ang reason ko for doing this is to help us be familiar sa concept para makita nyo kung paano ko to ginagamit sa mismong topic which I'm teaching. And also, para in case you would like to receive mentoring ay maging mas madali nyo magawa ang method. So, uh, let's discuss 4-H apologetics. So, ang 4-H apologetics ay isang easy-to-follow na method na marked by four steps. Hear, help, heal, and honor. Ang method ay nakakatulong sa Christians in terms of accurately understanding ang mga arguments, giving counter-arguments sa pag-communicate ng thoughtful na apologetic, and also it helps people to have a solid view of who God is, ng gospel ni Christ, and it helps us see kung paano i-apply ang truths that we have learned sa ating Christian life. So nang na nakabigay na ako ng definition, eh, let's proceed to describe ang purpose ng each step. Then share kung paano ba, kung ano ba yung questions na need natin masagot for each step. So ang unang step ay tinatawag na here. Basically, ang intention here is to understand accurately kung ano ba ang doubt or objection against Christianity. Ang unang need natin ma-identify ay ang argument ng doubt. In order for us na ma-identify kung ano ang argument ng doubt, we need to answer ang questions na what is the claim and what is the support. Ang claim ay basically a proposition ng position ng isang person. So ulitin ko. Ang claim ay basically a proposition ng position ng isang person. So basically isa itong statement ng opinion ng isang tao. Ang example nito ay an all-good and all-powerful God does not exist. Tapos, yung support naman, ito yung reason ng person for holding the claim. So, ang support ay ang reason ng person for holding the claim. Ang example nito ay, because evil exists in this world. So, kaya need natin ma-identify both ang claim and support kasi dapat clear sa atin kung ano ba ang argument ng objection or doubt. So, ang argument sa example natin is, an all-good and all All powerful God does not exist because evil exists in this world. After nito, syempre, need natin alamin ang provenance, which is ang source kung saan possibly nakuha ng person ng doubt na yun. And also ang problem, which is ang logic kung paano problematic sa Christianity ang isang view, if true, ang doubt or objection. Ang second step naman ay ang help. Ang help ay ang part where we debunk ang argument ng doubt. Ang questions na meant to be answered dito ay, what is the counter-argument? And what is your negative apologetics? Ang counter-argument basically ay a counter sa argument ng doubt. Just a clarification sa counter-argument, di naman necessary na may counter for both sa claim and support. Ang counter na pwede mo gawin ay either sa claim or sa support or both. Ang important to note here ay ang kukontrahin mo lang is kung ano ang mali na part sa argument ng doubt. Yun ang gagawan mo ng statement mo na counter. Ang negative apologetics naman ay kung bakit mali ang objection or doubt ng kausap mo. So dito may ipapakita ang justification mo for your argument para ma-establish mo ang counter-argument mo. Ang third na step naman ay ang heal. Ito naman ang part kung saan we recuperate natin ang idol or wrong idea about God. This is where we will also give people yung reason kung bakit tayo tama. Ang tawag dito ay positive apologetics. Di kasi enough for people to know that we, what we are against. Pero dapat ay for what we are for then. Or kung anong ating pinaglalaban. Ang reason for this kasi is di naman porket mali sila, ay tama na tayo. Kaya hindi din natin maipakita ang reason for our beliefs. 
Ang fourth and last step ay ang honor. This is the part where the correct idea about God na shown sa positive apologetics will be connected sa gospel. This is where we will discuss din ang action point natin in light of what we have learned. So ngayon, matapos ko na i-explain briefly ang 4-H apologetics. So if you want to know more, please feel free to ask me directly for personal mentorship or si Pastor John, or you could go sa aming first semester na for each apologetic seminar workshop to learn more. So, may mga nag-take na ng mentorship na to, tapos, nung natapos nila yung for each apologetics, nag-present din sila. Yung uh, example to, si La River, si Jessel, si Franz, and so, nag-present sila, tapos, eh, yung mga kapwa students nila, ina-ask din sila about their particular topic. So maganda to kasi highly integrative siya. So hindi lang kayo merely natututo how to defend the faith. Pero how you could do it in a biblical way. And so now na we were able to talk briefly about the 4-H apologetics method, let us now proceed to talk about the topic proper. So may mga scientists and other atheists who hold the conflict model ng science and religion. Ang mga proponents nito would say na science and religion are basically incompatible at reflected daw ito in two ways. Ang first ay ang mga religious beliefs or mga theological views ng bawat religion ay hindi ma-reconcile with scientific claims. Kasi ang scientific claims ay backed up daw ng scientific na research. For them, dahil dito, it follows ng truth claims ng both science and religion ay hindi compatible. At dahil ang scientific na truth claims ay backed up ng research, then dapat i-revise na natin ang ating religious beliefs. Ang second naman na way na nakikita nila na di compatible ang science and religion ay sinasabi nila na ang nag-favor ng religion ay ang beliefs daw nila ay subjective in nature. Personal at based sa de-reliable at hindi trustworthy na arguments and sources. And relative daw ito sa culture, time at place, kung saan practice ang religion. Tapos ang science naman daw ay rational at objective at based siya sa universal standards of reason and evidence na accepted everywhere. Ang view na ito, ang religion ay subjective at ang science ay objective, ay widely held by prominent thinkers daw. Ngayon ay sa philosopher na si Brendan Sweetman. Sa mga nag sa conflict model sa science and religion, I often cited si Giordano Bruno as a historical example ng labanan between the two. Ang argument nila is, quote, Giordano Bruno is a classic example of a scientific theorist who is persecuted by the church so that they'll be able to preserve their superstitious dogma and prevent the advancement of science. So, uh, two people who hold to this view ay ang kilalang British na neurobiologist na si Colin Blakemore at ang American na astrophysicist and cosmologist na si Neil deGrasse Tyson. So si Colin Blakemore, sabi niya sa documentary niya na God and the Scientists ay, I think Bruno's execution marked the beginning of a battle between faith and reason. The dangers I faced for my science came from a small group of fanatics. But during the Renaissance, most threats to scientists had the backing of the mighty Catholic Church. Si Neil deGrasse Tyson naman sa show ng National Geographic na Cosmos ay sabi, Ten years after Bruno's martyrdom, Galileo first looked through a telescope, realizing that Bruno was right all along. The Milky Way was made of countless stars invisible to the naked eye, and some of those light in the sky were actually other worlds. Bruno was no scientist. His vision of the cosmos was a lucky guess because he had no evidence to support it. Like most guesses, it could well turn out wrong. But once the idea was in the air, it gave others a target to aim at, if only to disprove it. For context, let me sh show a short video to show ang sinabi ni Neil deGrasse Tyson about kay Bruno. In the context of the cosmos, we are small. We may just be little guys living on a speck of dust, afloat in a staggering immensity. But we don't think small. This cosmic perspective is relatively new. A mere four centuries ago, our tiny world was oblivious to the rest of the cosmos. There were no telescopes. The universe was only what you could see with the naked eye. Back in 1599, 
Everyone knew the sun, planets, and stars were just lights in the sky that revolved around the Earth, and that we were the center of a little universe, a universe made for us. There was only one man on the whole planet who envisioned an infinitely grander cosmos. And how was he spending New Year's Eve of the year 1600? Why, in prison, of course. There comes a time in our lives when we first realize we're not the center of the universe, that we belong to something much greater than ourselves. It's part of growing up. And as it happens to each of us, so it began to happen to our civilization in the 16th century. Imagine a world before telescopes, when the universe was only what you could see with the naked eye. It was obvious that Earth was motionless and that everything in the heavens, the sun, the moon, the stars, the planets, revolved around us. And then a Polish astronomer and priest named Copernicus made a radical proposal. The Earth was not the center. It was just one of the planets, and like them, it revolved around the sun. Many, like the Protestant reformer Martin Luther, took this idea as a scandalous affront to scripture. They were horrified. But for one man, Copernicus didn't go far enough. His name was Giordano Bruno, and he was a natural-born rebel. He longed to bust out of that cramped little universe. Even as a young Dominican monk in Naples, he was a misfit. This was a time when there was no freedom of thought in Italy. But Bruno hungered to know everything about God's creation. He dared to read the books banned by the church, and that was his undoing. In one of them, an ancient Roman, a man dead for more than 1,500 years, whispered to him, of a universe far greater, one as boundless as his idea of God. Lucretius asked the reader to imagine standing at the edge of the universe and shooting an arrow outward. If the arrow keeps going, then clearly the universe extends beyond what you thought was the edge. But if the arrow doesn't keep going, say it hits a wall, then that wall must lie beyond what you thought was the edge of the universe. Now, if you stand on that wall and shoot another arrow, there are only the same two possible outcomes. It either flies forever out into space, or it hits some boundary where you can stand and shoot yet another arrow. Either way, the universe is unbounded. The cosmos must be infinite. This made perfect sense to Bruno. The god he worshiped was infinite. So how, he reasoned, could creation be anything less? was the last steady job he ever had. And then when he was 30, he had the vision that sealed his fate. In this dream, he awakened to a world enclosed inside a confining bowl of stars. This was the cosmos of Bruno's time. moment of fear, as if the bottom of everything was falling away beneath his feet. But he summoned up his courage. I spread confident wings to space and soared toward the infinite, leaving far behind me what others strained to see from a distance. Here, there was no up, no down, no edge, no center. I saw that the sun was just another star, and the stars were other suns, each escorted by other Earths like our own. The revelation of this immensity was like falling in love. Bruno became an evangelist, spreading the gospel of infinity throughout Europe. He 
he assumed that other lovers of God would naturally embrace this grander and more glorious view of creation. What a fool I was. He was excommunicated by the Roman Catholic Church in his homeland, expelled by the Calvinists in Switzerland, and by the Lutherans in Germany. Bruno jumped at an invitation to lecture at Oxford in England. At last, he thought, a chance to share his vision with an audience of his peers. I have come to present a new vision of the cosmos. Copernicus was right to argue that our world is not the center of the universe. The Earth goes around the sun. It's a planet just like the others. But Copernicus was only the dawn. I bring you the sunrise. Outrageous! The stars are other fiery suns made of the same substance as the Earth. And they have their own watery Earths with plants and animals no less noble than our own. Are you mad or merely ignorant? Everyone knows there is only one world. What everyone knows is wrong. Our infinite God has created a boundless universe with an infinite number of worlds. Do they not read Aristotle where you come from? Or even the Bible? I beg you, reject antiquity, tradition, faith, and authority. Let us begin anew by doubting everything we assume has been proven. Heretic, infidel! Your God is too small! A wiser man would have learned his lesson. Bruno was not such a man. He couldn't keep his soaring vision of the cosmos to himself, despite the fact that the penalty for doing so in his world was the most vicious form of cruel and unusual punishment. Giordano Bruno lived at a time when there was no such thing as the separation of church and state, or the notion that freedom of speech was a sacred right of every individual. Expressing an idea that didn't conform to traditional belief could land you in deep trouble. Recklessly, Bruno returned to Italy. Maybe he was homesick, but still, he must have known that his homeland was one of the most dangerous places in Europe he could possibly go. The Roman Catholic Church maintained a system of courts known as the Inquisition, and its sole purpose was to investigate and torment anyone who dared voice views that differed from theirs. It wasn't long before Bruno fell into the clutches of the thought police. This wanderer, who worshipped an infinite universe, languished in confinement for eight years. Through relentless interrogations, he stubbornly refused to renounce his views. Why was the church willing to go to such lengths to torment Bruno? What were they afraid of? If Bruno was right, then the sacred books and the authority of the church would be open to question. Finally, the Cardinals of the Inquisition rendered their verdict. You are found guilty of asserting the existence of other worlds. All of the books you have written will be gathered up and burned in St. Peter's Square. Ten years after Bruno's martyrdom, Galileo first looked through a telescope, realizing that Bruno had been right all along. The Milky Way was made of countless stars invisible to the naked eye. And some of those lights in the sky were actually other worlds. Bruno was no scientist. His vision of the cosmos was a lucky guess because he had no evidence to support it. Like most guesses, it could well have turned out wrong. But once the idea was in the air, it gave others a target to aim at, if only to disprove it. Bruno glimpsed the vastness of space, but he had no inkling of the staggering immensity of time. How can we humans, who rarely live more than a century, hope to grasp the vast expanse of time that is the history of the cosmos? Based on the video, kasi, uh, may kita natin doon na it's clear na si Bruno, he had a vision of space where there are other stars and planets. 
and that he shared this with others. And dahil dito, he was excommunicated by the Roman Catholic Church. He was expelled by the Calvinists of Switzerland and by Lutherans in Germany. And we can see that he was even burned at the stake dahil abuse niya na ito. And, uh, syempre, if this doubt is true, this is problematic kasi. Uh, if this is true, then pwede may establish na dati ang church ay isang mighty force na linalabanan yung flourishing ng mankind dahil sa pag-suppress nila ng science. Ibig sabihin nito na ang irrational beliefs ng religions ay eh dapat may eradicate para mag-benefit ang human civilization. Ngayon, we ask, ano ba ang facts about kay Giordano Bruno? What I'll argue is that Giordano Bruno's death was not because of his scientific theory, but rather because of heresies against the Catholic Church. I'll show na mali ang argument nila by first establishing ang nature ng Christian faith. Then second, I will talk about the historical facts about Giordano Bruno's death. Let's start sa nature ng Christian faith. I'll read muna a quote from Dinesh D'Souza, then expound on it. Ang sabi niya sa kanyang book na What's So Great About Christianity ay, quote, An unbiased look at the history of science shows that modern science is an invention of medieval Christianity. And the greatest breakthroughs in scientific reason have largely been work of Christians. Of these, only one, Christianity, was from the beginning based on reason. Judaism and Islam are primar primarily religions of law, end quote. So si Dinesh D'Souza, he argued uh, sa quote na, before religion daw, as we know it, ay we had animism, kung saan ang universe ay seen in an, an enchanted way. This means daw na ang bawat ilog, puno, or mga bato ay iniisip na populated na mga spirits. Ang world for them ay mysterious, capricious, hindi predictable, at hindi controllable. Tapos, dumating daw ang mga polytheistic na religions tulad ng sa Babylonians, mga Egyptians, and mga Greeks. Ang bawat isa ay may gods na minsan immortal, minsan hindi. And sila ay involved sa daily na pagwork ng nature, like sa paggawa ng mga bagyo at lindol. Ang pag-make ng humans to stags, or in other words, ay gawing male na deer ang isang tao. Naalala ko rin na si Socrates ay hindi raw dapat na mag-bother sa regularities ng nature, yung philosophy. Tapos, si Plato sa Phaedo ay negative ang view niya ng body kasi it hampers daw the soul daw sa quest for truth. So far, at least, based sa animism and polytheism, ay hindi consistent sa worldviews na yun ang assumptions that we have for science. Ni Susa mentioned din ang pag-appear ng religion sa East, which is Hinduism and Buddhism. Dito, we can see na ang Hinduism ay pwede maging pantheistic or polytheistic. Ang Buddhism naman ay pantheistic or atheistic. Sa pantheistic aspects ng religions na ito ay walang distinction sa external world sa tao mismo. Ito ay dahil na sinasabi nila na ang universe ay yung impersonal God na same din sa atin. This defies logic and reason, which are two philosophical na presuppositions ng science as an example. Also, Minention din ni D'Souza na ang Judaism and Islam ay primarily na religions of law. Ang sinasabi niya ay both ay naniniwala na may divine na lawgiver na nag-issue ng edicts na authoritative sa nature and sa human beings. Sa Jews daw ay limited lang ito sa people ni God, pero sa Islam ay nag-apply siya sa lahat. For both ay divinely revealed ang law at dapat ito sundin ng mga tao. Though both ay pwede naman mag-engage sa debates, ay more siya on how to best interpret and apply ang written codes ni God. In Christianity, it shines more than both kasi hindi siya religion of law, pero religion of creed. Ang comment ni Dinesh is that obsessed ang Christianity with doctrine or sa mga set of true na beliefs tungkol sa relationship ng tao kay God. He cited ang philosopher na si Ernest Fortin to say na ang highest discipline ng Christianity is theology. Ang Christian theologian ay charged na gamitin ang reason niya to understand ang ways ni God. Ang Hinduism ay Bud and Buddhism daw ay hindi pwede mag-investigate sa purpose ni God in the same way na ginagawa ng Christian theologians. In order to establish this, si Dinesh, pinakita niya na Christianity is a religion of reason, 
by showing Augustine as thinking that time was created by God, which is consistent sa findings ng modern physics na nagsasabi na nag-start daw ang time when the universe started. Si Aquinas din, I mentioned sa pag-argue na ang isang series para magkaroon ng being or existence ay dapat nakadepend ito on something na outside the series. Si Anselm naman ay ang nag-argue na si God, by his very definition, must exist necessarily. This, mean, this means na hindi kaya ni God na hindi mag-exist. Maliban dito, if I may add, syempre, Christianity is a religion na naniniwala na may distinction between kay God and sa creation, and also sa ating mga tao with the universe. We are said to be made in God's image rin, and also ang universe ay created based sa wisdom and power ni God, and it is designed to providentially work as God intended. This shows ng Christianity as a worldview best account sa lahat ng philosophical na presuppositions ng science, which are Morality, free will, logic, realism, or existence ng external world, ang, uniform, uh, un, ang uniformity of nature, na nature acts consistently as they are supposed to act, reason, and causality. In light of this, then it's reasonable for us to believe ang sinasabi ni Dinesh de Souza na the premise of modern science is based on Christian metaphysics. Now that we are able to talk about the nature of Christian faith, let's talk naman about the historical facts tungkol sa death ni Giordano Bruno. Sa discussion kanina sa argument ng doubt, we see na sinabi ni Neil deGrasse Tyson, though hindi scientist si Bruno, ang guess niya sa vision of the cosmos ay isang idea na pwede ma-verify, which is something na pursuit ng science. Ang vision niya daw sa cosmos ay ang reason, kaya siya na-execute na excommunicate ng Roman Catholic Church, na expel ng Calvinists sa Switzerland, and also ng mga Lutherans sa Germany. Sa video, we can see na pati sa Oxford ay minaliit daw siya dahil sa kanyang view ng, sa cosmos din. And lastly, I burned siya at the stake dahil dito ng Catholic Church. So to uh, answer this, to start, let me quote ang biographer na si Ingrid Roland, author ng Giordano Bruno, philosopher or heretic. Ang sabi niya ay, quote, Giordano Bruno's conviction for heresy hinged on two points. His refusal to believe that the bread of communion was literally transformed into the body of Christ and his refusal to renounce as heretical the eight propositions distilled from his writings by Robert Bellarmine. But the eight propositions in themselves did not motivate his sentence. In his last defenses, Bruno declared that the inquisitors had no right to dictate what was heresy and what was not. It was this denial of their authority that sealed his face, end quote. Based dito ay in K. Rowland, na kaya napunish si Bruno ay dahil sa kanyang heretical views. And also, what sealed his fate ay ang pag niya sa authority ng Inquisition. Let me share here din ang views ni Bruno which guided ang Inquisition sa kanilang final na deliberation. Quote, about Christ. Christ's miracles were illusory and that he was a magician. He was unwilling to die. He could predict that he will be hanged since he was a wretch. About the Trinity, he denies the Trinity since there is no distinction of persons in God. This makes him imperfect. About multiple worlds, he believes in infinite worlds because God would make as much as he can. About souls of men and beasts, Souls created by the work of nature pass from one animal to another. Men's souls are the same when they return to be born after the flood. About the Catholic Church, he believes that this religion has many blasphemies against God. About sins, sins will not be punished, all will be saved. About the art of divination, he wants to pay attention to this art and let other people follow after him. End quote. So at least, based sa the reason ng Inquisition for punishing Bruno, ay hindi ito based sa scientific theory niya, but this is based sa kanyang heresies. To add, let me share in ang facts about yung sa nangyari kay Bruno na sinasabi ni Neil deGrasse Tyson na yung vision niya daw ng cosmos ang reason kaya siya na-excommunicate ng Roman Catholic Church, na-expel ng Calvinist sa Switzerland, and also ng mga Lutherans sa Germany. And kaya siya na maliit sa Oxford. So, sa Roman Catholic Church naman, ay nung si Bruno ay Dominican priest pa, 
for some reason, ay si Domenico Vita ay pinainvestigahan siya noong 1576. Itong case na ito ay based sa lumang information kung saan sinagot ni Bruno ang isang professor ng philosophy sa Dominican College sa Rome. Ito ay si Agostino de Montalcino. Ang argument niya is sa intellectual respectability ng heretics. Si Montalcino kasi ay may prejudice na ignorant ang mga heretics and si Bruno defended na learned sila kahit papano. Ginamit niya si Arius bilang example and ginamit niya si Augustine para i-back up ang Arya na position. Sa San Domenico Maggiorian naman ay nag-preserve sila ng report about sa attack ni Bruno sa book na Seven Joys of the Virgin and tinanggal niya lahat ng images sa kanyang room. Basically, during this period ng investigation, si Giordano Bruno ay tumakas papunta sa ibang lugar. Ang mga Dominicans pa naman ay bawal mag-change ng residence without permission sa kanilang superiors. And dahil he read forbidden books then, he risked both na di na niya mag-practice ang office niya and also excommunication. He learned later on na excommunicated siya in absentia when he confessed his sins sa isang Jesuit priest. Sa Geneva, Switzerland naman, ay hindi siya na-expel dahil sa views niya about the cosmos. Pero dahil sa paggamit niya ng press para i-refute ang kanyang professor na si Antoine de la Fay. So, tungkol ito sa philosophy. Si la Fay, follower siya ni Theodore Beza. And dahil muntik na siya matanggal sa department ng philosophy before, dahil sa kanyang incompetence, ay sinumbong niya si Bruno sa consistory. Ito basically yung inquisition ng Geneva. So after two and a half weeks sa kulungan ay nag-apologize siya and sinunog ang kanyang mga work. Sa Germany naman, sa Wittenberg, ay kusa siya umalis to avoid na malaman ang history niya with the Calvinists. Sa University of Wittenberg that time ay persecuted ang mga loser and professors to change their view. Sa Helmstedt naman ay okay si Bruno dahil in favor sa kanya ang new duke na si Heinrich Julius. Sinuportahan niya si Bruno like his father. Ang problema lang doon ay yung head na Lutheran pastor na si Gilbert Voet ay against sa lahat ng dissent and inexcommunicate niya si Bruno for the reason of having Calvinist beliefs. Sa Frankfurt naman ay okay si Bruno dahil nakapagturo siya and publish ng mga work doon. Tapos sa Oxford, si Bruno sobrang nagalit naman siya doon kasi when he spoke there, ang mga English people ay pinagtatawanan siya and made fun of his gestures, energy, and ang kanyang tiny na stature. Ang mga tao ay wala talagang nakuha sa sinabi nga, except para i-imitate lang siya. And it's a hard time na maging Italian na professor that time sa England kasi sa Oxford ay they mock people dahil lang sa kanilang nationality. They assume kasi na ang isang Italian ay isang papis. So in light of that, sa mga nangyari kay Bruno sa Catholic Church, uh, Switzerland, Germany, and Oxford, ay clear na hindi dahil sa view niya ito ng cosmos, ng mga negative na bagay na mentioned related sa kanya. So in light of our discussion, I would say na important na pag-usapan natin itong alleged persecution ni Giordano Bruno kasi it's important na mapakita na inaccurate for people to say na ang death niya ay result ng bigotry ng religion against science. If totoo kasi ang doubt, it would seem to people na si God ay irrational and insecure. In a sense na gusto niya tayo ng manatiling primitive para sure na lagi tayong sumunod sa kanya. Of course, if si God ay someone na mas gusto na katakutan siya ng tao and not to be loved freely, ay ang ganitong God ay hindi worthy of our worship. And if people would think na ganito si God ay detrimental ito sa kanila spiritually kasi they will remove themselves from God who is the only being na able to help them and make them flourish. I have a student before who shared with me that ang view niya kay God before is more of a God na legalistic, na dapat perfect na masunod niya lahat ng demands nito, and that parang nag-aabang lang daw si God sa kanya na magkamali, para pleasurably ay mapunish siya nito and for her to be miserable. This affected her prayer life and church attendance drastically. She feels na parang dapat ay maayos niya muna ang sarili niya bago siya lumapit kay God and ask something. Yung mga uh, gano'n na similar notions kay God ang typically rejected ng skeptics. In a sense na ang re-reject nila ay hindi ang God of the Bible. The Bible asserts contrary sa objections nila na ayaw ni God na mag-flourish ang man dahil sa irrationality and insecurity niya. 
sinasabi kasi ng Bible ay that God wants man to flourish, which will show na si God ay rational and secure. Ang verse which I will show, which ang verse which will show this ay ang Genesis 1.28, kung saan ay sabi, God blessed them and said to them, Be fruitful and increase in number. Fill the earth and subdue it. Rule over the fish in the sea and the birds in the sky and over every living creature that moves on the ground. To explain this, I, we will rely heavily sa work ni Tim Keller sa book niya na Every Good Endeavor to expound on this passage. Ang sabi niya is that ang work ay design and dignity natin. At way daw ito to serve God through our creativity. In particular, sa pag-create ng culture. This is something that will help establish na si God ay for the flourishing ng man which, are, which we are trying to establish. Sabi ni Keller, nang sabi sa verse 28, to fill the earth and subdue it, ay ang command na tinatawag na cultural mandate. Ang ibig sabihin daw nito ay first, ang fill the earth ay calling natin para dumami. Though sinasabihan ni God na paramihin ng plants and animals, ay ang humans daw ay given a command na magparami actively. And they were given a detailed na job description after it was mentioned. For this reason, ay tao lang daw ang binigyan ng task to fill the earth intentionally. Though ang pagpaparami na ito ay hindi lang daw merely tulad ng pagpaparami ng plants and animals, hindi lamang gusto ni God na merely dumami ang human species. Gusto rin ni God na ang world ay maging filled with human society. This means not merely procreation, but also with human civilization. Ang job daw natin is to develop and build a human society. Ang second naman, which is ang pag-rule sa rest ng creation and to subdue them, ang subdue may imply daw na adversarial ang forces ng nature at needed sila na makonquer in some way. And may mga nag-complain daw na ang text gives license to man para i-exploit ang nature. But this is not the case kasi ang mandate ay given before the fall. Take note na ang fall made creation subject to decay. And also it brought up thorns along with the fruit. So may harmony pa sa creation when the mandate was given. So this means na walang violent intent ang pagsubdue sa earth. Ang pag-rule ng world as God's image bearers ay dapat makita more as stewardship or trusteeship. In a sense na si God ang may-ari ng world, pero linagay niya ito in our care para i-cultivate natin ito. So hindi siya mandate na tratuhin ang world at ang resources nito as if we can do whatever we want with it, like using, exploiting, or discarding it as we wish. Nevertheless, ay ang word na subdue ayon kay Keller has a strong meaning na real assertion ng will. We can see this sa creation ni God sa Genesis in a sense that nung ginawa ni God ang material world ay hindi niya ito ginawa as if ready-made na siya agad. This means nang ini-indicate ng word na subdue ng design ni God sa world in its original and unfallen form is that kakailanganin pa rin ng world to need some work from us. Ang magandang analogy dito sa creation needing some work para ni Keller ay that para tayong gardener. And creation is like a garden na need natin i-cultivate. Ang gardeners don't leave the land as is. Ang ginagawa nila is to rearrange ang ground to make it most fruitful para ma-maximize ang potential sa pag-grow and develop ng soil. Ang gardener ay may one goal in mind sa pag-rearrange para ang raw material ng garden would produce fruit, uh, food, flowers, and beauty. And ito ang pattern sa lahat ng work natin. Creative and assertive ang pattern. So, pinarearrange natin ang raw material ng creation ni God in a sense na mas natutulungan ang world in general, ang mga tao in particular, para mag-thrive and flourish. We can see this applied sa iba-ibang klase ng work. Ang examples given, given ni Keller ay sa pagsasaka, sa paggamit ng soil at seeds para makagawa ng pagkain. Sa music, sa paggamit ng physics ng sound and rearranging it to something na mas tara pakinggan at magbibigay ng meaning sa life. Pag gumamit tayo ng fabric para gumawa ng damit. Kapag naglinis tayo ng kwarto or pag gumamit tayo ng technology para ma-maximize ang paggamit ng kuryente. Pag we teach an uninformed mind a specific subject. Pag we help couples resolve their relational issues. Pag we use simple na materials para gawin ito na beautiful na work of art. Pag we use our resources to develop something new to add value sa people sa ating business. When we do this, 
Ayun ang nangyayari is that we continue sa work ni God sa pag-form, fill, and subdue. We bring order out of chaos kapag we use our creative potential. When we do this, uh, we follow God's pattern sa pag-develop ng culture. In light of this, it's clear na the irrational and insecure si God dahil sa desire niya for humans to flourish and dahil sa desire niya for us to cultivate his creation. Siyempre, if this is something na true of God, in a sense na gusto niya tayo mag-flourish here in this world, I would say na gusto rin niya na mag-flourish tayo on ultimate things. We have a great tendency kasi to get caught up so much like sa things na ginagawa natin which we believe ay kailangan natin. Don't get me wrong. Di naman masama in itself to get what we need. Pero whatever these things kasi na we think we need, it may become something that would be a competition sa will ni God mismo sa particular aspect ng life natin. Ang sabi nga sa Matthew 6.33, But seek, seek first His kingdom and His righteousness, and all these things will be given to you as well. So when the Bible uses the language ng kingdom ni God, ay nag-refer ito sa lugar kung saan nag si God as king. At ang righteousness ni God here says na important para sa atin to seek godly character. Ang ultimate priority natin ay ang sovereign rule ni God at ang tamang relationship with Him. And in light of this, I would like to ask each one of us, meron bang area sa life natin where we do not ultimately seek God's kingdom and righteousness? In a sense na hindi si God primary sa aspect na yun? Paano ba ito naka-affect sa ating walk with God? If you think na may specific area ka na hindi in line sa dapat na i-priority natin, I would like to encourage you to take heart. We have Christ who is our greatest model in terms of seeking God's kingdom and His righteousness. Ang sabi nga ni Jesus sa John 6.38, For I have come down from heaven not to do my will, but to do the will of Him who sent me. And because Jesus followed the will of the Father, then He lived perfectly. And also, He became our Redeemer by dying on the cross for our sins. Because Jesus sought first God's kingdom and righteousness, those who believe receive something of infinite value, ang salvation natin, which makes us enjoy God Himself. In view of this, I implore us to repent of each area where we don't seek God and His righteousness. And let's bask sa love ni God expressed in giving us what we ultimately need in Christ. I pray na may this love compel us para tayo mismo would choose to seek God and His righteousness sa bawat aspect ng life natin every day. Yun lang. Tapos na tayo sa topic for today. We can now proceed sa Q&A.